It's like, well, no, it's not because they're going to be banned. So we're actually going to see some of the, some of the second string stuff come out, which is really interesting. But we are ready to go into game. It's going to be Game King versus Isloth. We have Isloth starting on the Arrakis Queen. Game King on Emir. Let's take it away. Yeah, it's going to be, I mean, once again, Neckers are the big uh, thing we want to see here for Sloth. If he doesn't see any Neckers, he's going to be in trouble. He's going to start sweating because Necker is really the, more than any other deck, it's the baseline and, oh, yes. and just the yeah. most important card in this deck. You know, it's sort of like when uh, the Lesser Demons discards your Siri Nova, which happened in a match with Mogwai earlier, which was hilarious. But yeah, it is the essence of your deck. It is a Necker deck. That is what people call it. And because of that, if those Neckers are counted, it is absolutely binary, as we saw in those JJ Colomoan games. But I don't believe that's going to be the case here. I think that, you know, we're seeing a more traditional Spies outing from Game King. Not so much of a uh, I hate consume list as JJ. And there's an interesting possibility here. Um, obviously, we don't have a Swears in Game King's list. He didn't decide to, uh, you know, go all in on that Necker hate. But uh, we do have, for example, Enforcers that can start pinging Neckers down early before they start growing yes. and start, you know, shuffling and cycling them out of Sloth's deck as well. So it's a le legitimate strategy that as well. Uh, we're going to have to see what Game King decides to do to try and uh, kind of stop this Necker train and maybe stop um, having, you know, 20-point Neckers uh, in Sloth's deck by the end of the game. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if he does have the equipment to deal with it because actually, you know, traditionally Igni very, very good in the consume matchup. You can either hit the Neckers themselves or hit a huge Vran for a big point swing. But actually, we don't see Igni in Game King's list. We see him running Kahir instead. And then you start looking for answers to Neckers. And okay, you know, we've got some Infiltrators, we've got Menno. But there isn't too much necessarily if that tempo train gets going. I think, like you mentioned, the early Enforcer pressure could be key here. Yeah, not having Igni or Swears in the deck when you're playing against Consume and you're playing as Nilfgaard Spies, it's tough because those are cards that you really want to see in this matchup specifically. Uh, Game King probably thought that he, he would have a better deck uh, in general against other matchups if he didn't run those cards, so that's really just a meta call and kind of a tournament call uh, for Game King, but it might, you know, uh, come back and haunt him in this in this matchup here because uh, these Neckers, once they get out of control and get to that, you know, 19, 20 point range, there's even if you kill one, there's just another one going to come out, so it's, it's really tough with just Menno, for example. Yeah, it's an extremely tough, and you know, <laughs> you say, behind, might come back to bite him, but it is going to all fall down to the gameplay. We already see uh, somewhat, I imagine that's maybe a frustrating choice for Game King right now. He maybe I doesn't want to see the Infiltrator this early, looking to get those more engine units out. So, bit of a bumpy start for Game King. Yeah, I mean, we, we see already three spies, so the Enforcers can come down and kill the Necker immediately. And that's one less Necker you have to deal with. Uh, and you're killing it at four strength instead of, you know, uh, at 10 or 15 strength. So you're saving that value at least. But uh, it's hard to stop um, just the Necker spam with the Necker Warriors altogether because, of course, you have uh, no real way to kill fast enough where you, you kind of, you know, beat the Necker Warrior in terms of tempo. Oh, what a play here, though, coming out from Isloth. He knows that those Neckers are going to be taking several crossbow bolts to the face. So he actually buffs up the base strength using Wispess to tutor for Mandrake, which will, of course, increase the base strength by six. And that means that it can withstand five shots from an Imperial Enforcer, which gives him plenty of time to get that Necker Warrior out, eat it with the Vran, and then start slizzarding out the Necker Warriors to pile up the Neckers here. I really, really I'm like that reactive gameplay from Sloth. It's even more effective than that because later on, Brewer's Ritual can res that yep. Necker and it will be at 10 strength, at 10 base strength because Mandrake does not boost it, instead uh, elevates you know, the base strength of the unit. So it'll be at 10 strength, it'll make uh, Brewer's Ritual a much better card as well, just with an extra six points of tempo. There we go, we see the Necker, the resilient Necker surviving all of those hits, ready to be duplicated within the deck and Alza's Double Cross coming out. So he's choosing, this is a good play because even though he has a Necker Warrior in hand, he's choosing to play Alza's Double Cross to get that little bit of thinning, a little bit of added efficiency and two bonus points. So nice bit of efficient play from my Sloth. And it is good to keep a Necker Warrior in hand plus the ADC because uh, Sloth would have trouble if that uh, Necker Warrior were stolen with the Vigor Medic. Mm -hmm. You can't then cycle it with Slitters and it makes you, you kind of like gave up the game plan round one because you can't continue to, to print more Neckers in your deck. So uh, very wise from Sloth to keep a Necker Warrior in hand and have the ADC as well. Yeah, we see double enforcer thing here now though which is you know when Nilfgaard tempo gets really really scary I mean once we have those Vikavara medics getting out those emissaries the more enforcers on the board the more tempo that's going to be and he has another one in hand so Game King's sort of traditional Nilfgaard tempo looking very powerful here nonetheless. Although Sloth with red coin having you know going second and being with you know playing a deck that doesn't really need card advantage or doesn't really care too much about cards in general once uh, kind of the train gets rolling and you get like really uh the plays don't really matter because all your players are worth, you know, 30, 40 points in round three. So you don't care about cards. As long as your opponent doesn't have Swears or Igni or something like that, uh, you're fine to just, you know, kind of do whatever if you can get those Neckers in your deck. Yeah, Neckers is a very much so a do or die deck. And I just don't know if Game King's going to have the answers here, but we are going to find out as it progresses. Looks like Sloth is considering his avenues of play. If you're Sloth, what do you head for here? 
I mean, the longer you get this round to go, the better, because if Genking's using his engine units now, like the Enforcers, already using two Enforcers and a Brigade, that's already half of your engine units spent in round one that you can't use in a long round three, for example. So the more engine units that Sloth is able to get out while still cycling uh, his Necker Warriors and continue to get some consume ticks and getting more Neckers in his deck, that's really all he wants, just to kind of stall this out. I don't think he minds losing this round too much. It's not really no, the biggest so. deal. Yeah. And that's what we see here. Forktail coming down, eating the Necker Warrior, opens it up to be Slizzard, get even more Neckers in that deck. Of course, Arrakis Queen still sitting there to boost them all up once they've been duplicated. Rain Farm looks to be coming out here, but uh, we see Joaquim in hand, so I imagine that this is going to be Cantarella. Game King and his famous love for Iris. Holding strong, Iris is making an appearance in this Northgard deck, but, you know, in this matchup, it's not the silver you want. You would, Game King right now, even, even though he loves Iris, he would happily throw it out for a Swears right now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's in, Irish is a card that hasn't been played as much uh, nowadays. It kind of fell off a bit, but Game King, he's always he's loved playing this card and he's playing it now. And we see that he has also a Nausicaa Brigade in his deck. It's the difference from a lot of other lists being brought to this open because people have kind of, you know, stopped playing Iris. And with that, you kind of, it's not as, as useful to play a Brigade as well. So they've just gone for you no know, Brigade at all in the Spy decks. Yeah, Iris, uh, Iris and Spies, like you said, is sort of... Maybe like, you know, a previous meta's gem. Uh, Iris more typically found in weather decks these days, actually, with Wild Hunt Riders' ability to instantly kill them. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's an interesting inclusion from Game King, and I think it might be one that comes to haunt him in this matchup. It looks like we're going to see the no Vicavari time. medic come out. Of course, he can double this up with Emir, putting it back in his hand, which gives him a whole load of spies to play. And that spy, the Kentarella that was played by Rainfarn, makes it so that now uh, Game King can start pressuring and kind of use his, his, you know, more effective tools without feeling like he's kind of losing out. Um, because he does have, obviously, uh, card advantage back if he's able to overtake here, so uh, Sloth can't stall as easily anymore. Yeah, definitely. And of course, Game King can use the perceived threat of a Meno for a big point swing to apply pressure to Isloth too, because even though he hasn't got it in hand, Isloth doesn't know that. So of course, there could be a 29-point Meno sitting waiting to burn that Forktail. So yeah, it's a really nice um, sort of like imposed threat by Game King here. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's these mind games are really important because uh, your opponent obviously doesn't know what you what you're. He knows you're bringing Menno in the spy deck, obviously. Yeah. So he can expect it. He just doesn't know if it's in hand or not. And the mind games sometimes make you uh, make plays that seem good if Menno is in hand, but are not as effective if he isn't in hand. So it's always important to try and lead your opponent in the wrong direction and get you know an extra point or two um, doing by doing that. So uh, Gang King, of course, he's on top of this and, and definitely knows to utilize all his mind games to try and get an advantage. Yeah, definitely. We're talking about the retroactive tempo of those enforcers. I mean, we could end up seeing that come out now. The change in the Enforcer means, of course, you can play it at any point in the round, and depending on how many spies there are, it'll fire that many times. So he's still got two powerful engine units, you know, he's got 12 points sitting in a Brigade, and, you know, 12 points, six of it being damage, sitting in an Enforcer. So he can't quite kill a Necker with that. I imagine he might just want to go for the Brigade, so that when he, you know, hopefully gets more spies out for his sake, he will be able to actually start killing those Neckers again. And the Barbagazi would present, prevent a dry pass from Game King yep. in round two. Obviously, the Spy has been used in this round, and there is no way to create Spies anymore in round two. So Sloth knows he's safe as long as he doesn't play a Spy, and obviously Consume doesn't really play Frightener at all. So there's a pass, knowing that he prevents a dry pass. And, yeah, more than happy. And wants to prevent the Enforcers from trying to kill the Barbagazi, for example. So Sloth's going to be pretty pleased with that round, I think, especially after just seeing what happened to Colomo and just you know making sure those Neckers are in his deck completely unaffected. He's probably going to be pretty pleased with that. He doesn't mind losing that round whatsoever, like you said. Neckers plays in a very unique way, where uh, card advantage and round score isn't necessarily so relevant to it until it really starts unleashing its power. So I think they'll be pretty close. Yeah, the first round was basically just set up, trying to get, you know, Neckers in your deck, getting him a little bit buffed, making sure you have, you know, some, some Slizzer targets as well with a Fork Tail, for example. Other than that, even though he's losing on even, he has a Dry Pass here, and the initial plays in the start of the round should be stronger than Spies, because Spies uh, do a little bit more setup. Uh, they start off kind of slow, so they start playing Emissaries, and then they start ramping up um, as the plays go on, as the turns go on. So Sloth, not too worried. I think he can, he can definitely keep up, keep up here, and I think I if he knows that, he can... Uh, not be too worried. Oh, that's a huge steal there. That's Making Brewish Ritual a lot worse in the next round. Yeah, that's a big, big steal. Definitely weakens the Ritual. And uh, I believe that Sloth currently has four Neckers in his deck. Of course, sadly, we don't have the ability to uh, view deck statistics right now. Hopefully, we'll get that in the future. But I'm going to say four because he played two Necker Warriors. That's three in the graveyard. So, you know, I can do my maths. But it's going to be interesting how he handles this round because he wants to get his utility done but while not getting dangerously out-tempoed by Game King because while card advantage isn't the be-all and end-all, it still helps. Yeah, I think Game King knows that he's not going to get card advantage over Sloth in this turn and by stealing that Necker, he's basically just getting six points of carry over that or stealing six points of carry over from Sloth in the next turn because he's expecting, you know, Brutus Ritual to be played and to res that 10-strength Necker. So, you know, Game King is trying to maybe uh, make 
Sloth is round three, just a tiny bit yes. worse. Yeah, it's nigh upon pseudo carryover, like you said, because of course it is effectively taking away six points from Sloth next round. So nice play by Game King. It looks like the Necker Warrior will be getting. What's he going to go for? Yeah, there? and the Asire is trying to break the Slizzards yeah, here, trying very, to make sure cool. that Slizzards uh, don't have a target, or maybe if, if the only way to bring out a Necker is by using a Slizzard, this would also break it. So these are plays from Ganking that aren't, you know, the co most common plays you normally see in, in ladder and stuff, but they're plays that. If they work and Sloth doesn't have a way to get a Necker here, then he can be in trouble. Uh, we see Game King's face there. He didn't expect the Necker Warrior from hand. Sloth, very, very happy that he kept that in hand. But I, like I say, even though it got countered, I really love that Asire plan from Game King. It's a really, really nice move in this instance. Yeah, I mean, you can mess with your opponent's deck with Asire. Not just, you know, shuffle back road, shuffle back a, a, a strength thing, Nausicaa Brigade, but also mess up with your you know, opponent's graveyard and try and, not just against Galaga, but against other factions, and try and, you know, mess up their game plan as well. Yeah, definitely. I think the Consume Engine is going to get rolling pretty soon. And Ice Sloth is, you know, as much as Game King is playing a very powerful faction that has a bunch of great things at its utility, the Consume is going uncountered. And this means that the train has started to leave the station. I mean, this is something that you got to deal with or you lose to, you know? We've played against enough Consume on ladder to know how this goes. And we do you see know, Iris, which is a very funny interaction because uh, the Vran will just, you know, consume that Iris. Yes, you don't even have to kill yeah. it. I mean, your opponent kills it for you, which makes Iris very good against Consume. And that might be a tournament tech from Game King as well. Maybe he doesn't favor Iris and ladder, but when he knows that your opponents are going to play a lot of Consume, it's, it's safe to say that it's, you know, a 25 point silver. Why not play it? Yeah, definitely. And Isoth may not be expecting the Iris. I mean, Game King is, I would definitely say, the most prominent sort of, you know, uh, lover of that card. But he may not be expecting it. It is very out of fashion, especially with a lot of players very uh, conscious of the fact that Consume will be arriving at tournaments, tending to tech in the spheres. Or we've even seen things like, you know, weird silvers that you know, previously would be completely irrelevant come out. So the Iris will be a lot of points. And like you say, he can immediately drop it in front of the round for the kill. But... He's getting down two finishes, really. He, Joaquim is an expensive card to play. Summoning Circle, too. So it's going to be past time fairly soon after this for Game King, I imagine. If Arrakis Queen is played this next turn, he could Summoning Circle the Iris to make it, you know, two 25-point silvers. <laughs> it's very true. There's not a better Summoning Circle target than that. So he has to be careful with what he does here. He has to really watch out for that and really think about Summoning Circle as an option because he might, you know, definitely get punished otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I believe even with the summoning circled Iris, the catch up of Arrakis Queen, as long as, you know, well, that neck is going to get eaten by the Vran regardless. I don't even necessarily know if it would be a valuable play for Game King at this point. Yeah, it's definitely tough to say. I mean, Joachim, you want to save for round three for sure, but mm -hmm. you're looking at, at Sloth as finishers. I mean, just Bruce Richmond to a Forktail or a Slizzard Forktail, or either, even Phoenix into a Slizzard Forktail is a ton of points, like really a lot of points. And Joachim. Used to be, you know, the great, the best finisher in the game, nothing compared to Spies, but nowadays against Consume, for example, it pales in comparison. Yeah, it really does. So we're seeing what looks like Marching Order come out here. That's going to be a Shadow, which is going to play a Necker, I'd imagine. So here we go. Or it is still, it's the third Slizzard. Slizzard. Apologies, it is the third, it's the third Slizzard. Slizzard in the game and brings out another Necker. So that means that now there are, you know, one less Necker, it's great for Game King. He knows that there are a few less Neckers in the, in the deck, but I think there's still going to be enough for uh, the finisher with Brutish Ritual and, you know, maybe a Forktail or a Rackus Queen even. Yeah, it's going to be interesting what Game King does here. Of course, as soon as he passes, that Vran eats, and that means that Isloth does get the pass, so he cannot pass for card advantage at this point. And now Summoning Circle is obviously not as fantastic. Um, he can try and maybe stall this round out, but because uh, he knows he's not going to get back card advantage, there's really no point. He's just trying to waste his opponent's cards, which is, you know, a viable strategy because Summoning Circle in the next round not going to be very good either. Um, so at this moment, really, there's nothing that Sloth can do to punish this very low tempo play. Um, just stalls out one more play and forces Sloth to play out uh, one more card at least. Um, but other than that, I think he's going to probably save the Bruce Ritual for the next turn and use Arrakis Queen now and just buff yeah. everything on, on Yeah, he'll board. be using Arrakis Queen now, I believe, because Brewer's Ritual, of course, you want to roll into drawing a Forktail or any sort of consume, really, once you've got that. So I like Game King stalling out another play. You know, he's trying to get critical plays out of consume's hand. That is how he's going to win this match, if he does. And so while it is an expensive stalling tactic, it's one that I think he had to use to just to survive. And Consume could get unlucky in a short round, not have a way to pull a Necker, pull, for example, a dead Forktail that we've seen before in Game 1, so, uh, with JJ and Coleman, so, it's an option, I mean, JJ, uh, Game King trying to really, uh, maybe go for that as well, trying to see if, if there could be a dead card from Sloth in Game, in Round 3, and, and make it so that, uh, he wins that way, but as we see here, Sloth, a ton of tempo, uh, and Game King has to pass here. 
Yeah, here we go. So this is going to be heading into round three. We have Joaquim versus Bruce Ritual. Bruce Ritual resurrecting two Death Wish units. And Joaquim, of course, playing top unit of your deck and boosting it by 10. So two very, very powerful cards. As long as we see an activator for this Ritual, Forktail, there's ah, a perfect there draw. Go. I don't think uh, there will be any more. Yeah, he's not going to risk it. I mean, Sloth knows he has there's a no lot of points to risk that. in those two cards. And very little that game can, can do um, to kind of counter that. So... He's going to go for the very standard double necker. Obviously, we don't see the 10-strike necker because it was stolen by Game King, but still, it's going to be a very explosive finish here. Yeah, this is real dangerous territory for Game King. Although he has two very good cards, Kelayak and Joaquim, he is just going to fall behind potentially with this Forktail. Forktail, the ability to consume two units, is just so powerful in a short round setting. Yeah, they're going to be really big neckers. They're not going to be, you know, the, the, the measly five or eight strength neckers that we saw in round one. They're going to be the finisher neckers, the big boys that have been ready and have been growing in the, in the deck. And they're ready to really, you know, get an explosive finish here in Sloth. Uh, we still see a lot of points from Game King. It might be pretty close, but I think in the end, Sloth might just edge ahead uh, with his fork tail play. Yeah, especially even the, yeah, even the five points from uh, Joaquim are painful at this point. And again, Brigade, not the greatest play in a short round three. I mean, you don't have really uh, points at all, so, or you don't have spies uh, anyway, so... It's a lot, there's not much to do there, and we see, of course, that there is no uh, Meno or Infiltrator combo either. Only ten, only one Necker coming out, though. There was only, only a one Necker left. Necker to come out, so there's 20 points to regain. Kelyak into 20 points. It, it, It'll be tough, I think. Chaining. I mean, I think there's so you have many to go for Emissary, emissary points, obviously, but there really isn't left in the deck that can do it, right? No, no, I don't think he can chain, right? I mean, this is... Uh, depends on the bronze he has left in his Ooh, deck. Oh, this is looking interesting. Oh my goodness, Game King. Looking like figuring out every possibility. This is where you really have to crunch the numbers and really try and uh, you know think about everything you can draw, how many points it's going to be, how many if you can ever overtake with any card. Like it's really high roll here. You can also just click emissary and hope. There's a Nausicaa. The Nausicaa's going to hit Joaquim. I believe that won't be enough. Oh, three, by three points. points! Incredibly close finish. That is masterfully played by Game King, actually, because honestly, he should have lost that by a much larger margin. Isloth managing to get his consumed gameplay out uncounted. Yet Game King, things like the Asaya play, the Enforcer pressure, really managing that game well. Unfortunate loss for him. Yeah, I mean, we thought we only, he had two Neckers left, Sloth in his deck, which is why we thought it was such a, you know, a blowout finish. But in the end, with only one Necker, it was a lot closer than we expected. And of course, Evgen King had a pretty good hand as well. So, I mean, three points, a lot. I think Sloth got a little bit nervous at the end there. But in the end, he pulled through and got the first win. Obviously on Red Coin, so maybe expected. Mm -hmm. um, consume. A pretty strong deck, especially if, you, if your opponent doesn't have hard counters like we saw in game one with JJ and Coleman. Obviously, no, no Igni, no Swears from Game King, so maybe an expected result in this first game. Uh, we'll see going forward how these other decks perform and how Game King's Consume performs as well. Yeah, Game King, of course, can get his own Consume-based revenge, but we have more leaders up to come. We have Usurper, Bran, Bran potentially a Bran Mirror, which would be interesting to see. And uh, it looks like, actually, we're going to see Game King playing his consume and uh, Isloth going on to his Usurper. Apologies, the screens are currently the wrong way around, but yeah, Usurper, first tournament appearance. Yeah, it, it's a complete just the switch from last uh, game in terms yeah. of factions, but although we do see Us Usurper instead of the Emir this time around, so a bit of a, you know, a bit of a spicy change here, but um, in the end, it's going to play out pretty similarly, I think. We're going to have to look at the deck list and see if there are different tech choices here, here from Sloth uh, to counter this uh, uh, consume deck from Game King. Yeah, let's get the list up now. We're just going to flick through them. I think this is going to be a pretty interesting match. Game King definitely looking for a little bit of revenge. We actually see some pretty similar looking deck lists. Mandrake making an appearance in Game King's Consumer List, though. We oh, do it's not... also in... Uh, yeah, Sloth, I think the yeah, Consumer List will be very similar yeah, because there is the a very standard, you know, tier one Consumer List going on around at the moment in the top of the ladder with these, you know, very good players. They all can trying to go to the most effective deck possible, and I think the Consumer List is pretty well established. Although a Super, or Super has Igni in his deck, so Sloth is running an Igni. He has that counter, at least, um, for the big brands. Uh, although there is no Spheres. Yeah, no Spheres from either player here. That's a risky thing when you think about it. Although, of course, we do have the wonderful ability of hindsight where we can see what's happening to with Consume. So, yeah, Usurper is going to be pretty key in this match, I imagine, actually. Something like a Radovid can really do a lot of damage against Neckers. Yeah, I mean, we see a different a different deck list here in general. Um, we don't see, for example, Iris. We do see Roach instead. It has a synergy with the Asire, for example. And, of course, we also don't see an Oscar Brigade without the Iris being in the deck. Hmm. What do you think of the open pass here from Sloth? It's interesting, giving control of round two and round three to consume, where they can really kind of... I mean, the spy is, synergy in the long run is great, but it's tough to say. I mean, there's a lot of points to be had with consume in a long round three. 
Yeah, definitely. I think that, uh, like you say, just giving control of the game lengths to consume is really, really interesting indeed. We do see Igni in his hand, though. That's going to be a very welcome card here, as well as Menno, too. So Sloth has some offensive capabilities against large point units, but it's just, you know, giving Game King the space to line up those Neckers and get them nice and developed is... It's an interesting tactic. I'm not sure what I'd make of it. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, Game King obviously has no Spy, uh, no Frightener is played in these consume lists, so... There's no way to get back that card advantage in this round. And of course, Gantarella would just answer that back pretty easily. Um, and I mean, in general, in Enforcers, I mean, Imperial is in a long round. The Game King not passing for card advantage means that he doesn't really care about that one card um, difference. So I assume he's going to go for a, a kind of a short round, too, that sets up these Necker Warriors, sets up, you know, all the kind of the, the train and, and the, the Necker, um, just copying all these Neckers back into his deck and making sure he has that kind of slow tempo train uh, part of the, the consume game plan done. There we go, we see the Mandrake actually choosing to banish Imperial Enforcer instead of buffing his own Necker. Very interesting decision from Game King. Yeah, we see two complete opposite decisions from both yeah. players. Um, Game King instead trying to kill the Enforcer instead of buffing his own Necker, for example. Yeah, and that Imperial Enforcer immediately has another one take its place, but of course, that is a big, big loss. Like, honestly, having... <laughs> that's half-tempo when Spies are played right now, so it's a pretty interesting choice from Game King. It's... I, th I think it's good. I think it's good. We definitely saw, well, like at the end, we saw only one Necker come out, and that Imperial Enforcer pressure really did contribute to that, so maybe he's wary of that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you, if you can kind of get rid of these Neckers now, where they're so low strength that they don't really pose any kind of threat, and, and get rid of the Neckers that are going to be a lot bigger later on, you're basically killing 20 strength Neckers right now. I mean, that's kind of the game plan. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. obviously giving tempo to your opponent, but I think it's fine here for Sloth, to be honest. Yeah, I think it's an interesting one, especially considering it's round two. Game King having, like, ultimate freedom to develop this. He's really got to be wary of those pressure methods and of those counters that will be available to Sloth. Sloth looking to his Cantarella now. Going to make that round nice and big, like we mentioned. That can line up a wonderful Igni target, as it is not going to eat the Necker Warrior. It's going to deny the Slizzard onto the Necker Warrior, and it's also going to enable Igni. So a really, really fantastic utility play in this matchup by Sloth. And these rounds, of course, even if you feed them, you know, three strength lizards you're still gonna, still gonna grow every single turn and over a long long round you can get potentially like 60 or 70 point igni so sloth definitely knows this yeah definitely and i think that he's going to be looking to stop the development of these neckers as much as he can but there is another necker warrior in hand forktail to to provide consumes however he is out of rounds yeah and the necker warrior in hand means that there is no cheeky play from a side where you can shuffle it back or steal it with vicar medic uh to Let try and you know uh make it so you can't really uh, you know, continue copying the Neckers here, and we see, of course, uh, probably want to get Monster's Nest, maybe, instead of the, the Necker Warrior, because he can cycle out yeah, the Necker the, Warrior the Necker anyway. Warrior is going to be fetched by Slizzard, I imagine, so Monster's Nest would seem to be the best choice here. So, we're going to see the coin go back to Sloth after summoning Circle into the Spy, of course, the classic Spy gameplay that is so prevalent right now, but it's nice for Game King. Honestly, the ability to just bounce out that Cantarella is really quite important. And Monster Nest can, you know, play mostly for two options in this, uh, I think, in this deck. Uh, Barbagazi 1 for carryover mm -hmm. uh, for round 3. Or if you want more tempo, you can go with Arrakis uh, Behemoth as well. It's, it's another option for tempo instead of carryover. So, two very distinct options. And of course, Barbagazi can also eat a Necker and create tempo that way as well. So, uh, most of the times, probably Barbagazi, but sometimes if you need the tempo in round 1, for example, with your very slow build-up with the Neckers and the Necker Warriors, you can play the, the Arrakis Behemoth as well. And there we go, we're going to see a Summoning Circle unto the Summoning Circled Cantarella and put right back in front of the Vran. However, that Vran is not on a one-timer this time, so it will not immediately get eaten, which gives Isloth the ability to potentially deal with it or to just replace a Necker Warrior in the line of the Vran and ensure that the Slizzard will be opened up for that third Necker Warrior, which he's put at the bottom of his deck with Cantarella. And of course, this uh, Necker Warrior trade, or this, this Spy trade with Summoning Circle, favors Sloth because he has that spice energy, and of course he also has um, the Agni and the Menon to punish these huge units, so uh, Game King doesn't really have that at all. Yeah, there's some really great offensive capability here from Sloth. He's lining up his sort of uh, tempo counter plays very, very nicely. The one thing that I am concerned by, though, is he's lining up great tempo plays in a round that Game King doesn't need to win because of the round one open pass, so yeah, while Menowing, you know, a 40, 50 point Vran is fantastic, if Game King doesn't have to win the round and he's just playing out his consume utility, he's not going to be as bothered. Well, but we see a, a two-card difference here, and, and uh, an Igni here on, on a very big uh, Vran or a Menno could potentially, you know, close that gap in one card, and if Sloth is two cards up for round three, that's fairly that's good big. even that's against big. consume. That's fairly good. Yeah, that's big indeed. That is a non-negligible card advantage, especially when you're playing as Nilfgaard, which gets such high average value per card. It's fantastic. So... 
Game King is going to start eating things now. He's got his Forktail, his Unseen Elder, another Slizzard. It's time to start buffing up all of those Neckers that have been put in the deck. Pretty powerful. Pretty powerful hand from Game King, but also a very powerful hand from Isloth. Isloth, all, all four golds available to him. Game King, Royal Decree for a gold of his choice. Brewess and Unseen... Well, sorry, I, I always keep wanting to say Unseen Elder. You know, Arrakis Queen. We Arrakis have, Queen. It's a new time, new leaders. F in the chat for the Unseen Elder. But yeah, it's uh, Arrakis Queen, of course. Very, very powerful leader. Yeah, and we see Meno coming out, and like we said before, swinging the, the point gap. And with just one card, and we see Sloth two, two cards up and still ahead. So he's pretty happy with his board state right now. Yeah, definitely. I just want to see the Usurper come out. I'm so impatient to see Usurper come out. I want to see the first ever Usurper play. I think this will be the first of any of the new leaders, actually, unless you're counting Arrakis Queen, right? Yeah, it definitely would be. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, Isloth has lots and lots of tools in his toolkit right now. But Game King is just keep going on. You know, Consume is not the most reactive deck in the world. So, Game King is just going to plow on with his game plan and try to develop those Neckers as much as possible. Yeah, the Rands do. I mean, they kind of equal carryover because you're kind of boosting all your Neckers in your deck already mm -hmm. um, for the round three finish. So, uh, just kind of... He's not really playing now to, to overcome uh, Sloth. I think he knows that... He's, he's playing be, to invest. Yeah. He's playing to invest in round three and kind of produce, you know, alternative carryover, basically. Yeah, definitely. He's just playing to, uh, yeah, make sure that that finisher is as big as possible. He knows that he's going to be cards down because of the uh, spies earlier, but he's got to make sure that the overwhelming power of those uncounted Neckers overwhelms that card advantage. It's, it's going to be tough. It can yeah. do, but it's going to be tough against a faction like Northgard. And the shorter he makes the round three, the more impactful those that card disadvantage is going to be. So Game King maybe, I mean... If he, if he waits till the very end, I mean, having two cards over your opponent with, you know, maybe three cards left to be played in round three is is a big, you know, impact in terms of percentage. So, it doesn't seem one game he's going to decide to pass. I really well. like this from Game King, though, eating those emissaries. I mean, it opens up the Vicavaro medics, but it shuts down engine units at the same time. So, fortunately for Sloth, he has double Vicavaros in his hand should he choose to, you know, utilize those this, this round. But he's probably going to want to use those round three. So, it's a interesting state. When you look at the card advantage, it's quite significant in the favor of Sloth, you know, he's also got his leader remaining, but those Neckers are really terrible, like, just, just Brew-S Forktail alone is so many points. Yeah, and the fact that he's still saving the Igni, he doesn't have to yes. use his Igni this turn potentially, and he can save it for next turn, and that just means that, I mean, it's gonna be a huge swing no matter what, I think, he's gonna have a target for sure, even in a short round three. Yeah, definitely. It's just whether that target will, you know, get replaced <laughs> immediately. So that's one of the things with hitting Igni on a Vran over a Necker is the Vran is gone. The Necker's probably got a friend who's about to jump out the deck. So it's going to be an interesting one indeed. Yeah, and it makes Igni, you know, just a five-point play basically because it's not going to yeah. really get any value uh, if another Necker comes out to replace it. So uh, it's tough. I mean, Monster Nest, we can see Barbie Gazi could get some carryover for the next round as well. Yes. Although the Enforcers might just, you know, ping that down uh, depending on what it eats. So uh, it's, it's tough here for Game King. If you're Game King, when do you get out of this round, do you think? I think as early as possible. I mean, you're already going to have, you know, the big impact being four cards to six or, or five to seven. But uh, the more you play, the more impactful the, the card disadvantage is because two cards just mean more when there's less cards to be played in general. Yeah, and here we see the Barbagazi. I think it's likely that they'd have a hard time pinging it down. It's probably going to eat a relatively high strength unit. There we go. Going for a nine strength Necker, disabling another spur. Nope. Going for... Oh. I mean, at this Shibating point, it's... Me. Are you going for tempo, really? Because you're already really behind. You know that your opponent is still going to have gold. He's still going to have Igni, for example. So I think you just save the Neckers for later. Yeah, I think that's the right choice. 18 health on that uh, Barbara Ghazi is going to be tough to chip away with double enforcers. You know, you need quite a few spies to get rid of that. So I think that that Barbara Ghazi likely survives. And Game King's got to get out of this round now, right? Yeah, I think we'll see a pass after this, to be honest. Um, he has, obviously, high-value cards in hand, so he doesn't really want to use them. And... Uh, I think it'd be definitely be a time to pass, you know, so, sooner rather than later. Yeah, Sloth also looking at very high power cards in his hand. Got to wonder whether he plays the Igni, because it could potentially be dead next round. But he's actually going to go for a Vicavaro. Resurrect a Necker Warrior. And Asari could still, uh, you know, mess with Game King's Graveyard in round three if he's if he's expecting, you know, a Phoenix into a Slizzard, for example, into, you know, a card that he has in his Graveyard that he doesn't have in his hand. Um, it could potentially mess with that and cause a lot of problems for Game King. Yeah, definitely a side. We've already seen it used by Game King very well against consumers. Sloth may be looking to do similar. But Game King going in with the pass, heading into round three with Royal Decree, a Forktail, and Brewess Ritual up against the Mighty Hand and the Usurper himself. 
And we see World Decree that is going to be on Phoenix, so uh, you're going to have to be careful with the mulligans here because it could be a dead World Decree as well. So you have to be very careful. Yes. Um, not not get too much mulligan. He's going to keep his hand, to be honest. He's not going to risk it. I think it. he's going to keep that hand. We could see Bruess Ritual into Usurper Radovid double lock the Neckers. <laughs> that, that would be a sad... I mean, yeah, the ADC on the on one of the Neckers, so you have still have an option, but, but it would, yeah, it would be a big blow. It yeah, would be... disable one of Forktail's consumes. It would be pretty serious. I shall be as you command. And there we see a sire shuffling the monster's uh, graveyard. So Game King paying a lot of attention, seeing what was shuffled back, uh, and seeing how this affects his game plan and, and what he expected to do. Because obviously, if he plays Phoenix now into something that's dead, he's gonna be, you know, he's gonna regret it. So yeah, he'd probably regret that a little. He's bit. gonna study what what went on in his graveyard, obviously, and see what what happened there and how he can play around it. Yeah, it'll be interesting what he starts off with. He's going to open up with the Phoenix. Here we go. Oh, no. He loves doing this to me. He loves dragging a card half the way out. I say, oh, he's going to play that, and then he stops. Oh, nope. I'm just going to let him play his card. He's going for Phoenix. There we go. He's so. taking his time, making sure he's not making any mistakes. You obviously, <laughs> there's a lot of a lot at stake here. Um, a very important match for Game King, being 1-0 down already. Here we go, it is going to be pulling a Necker out. Phoenix, such a wonderful card added to Monsters recently. Really gave... Here, it's just one of the backbones of this archetype. Such a powerful resurrect. Yeah, and a great finisher as well for round three. Yeah, it's not even a monster's card. It's actually a neutral card. I always just think it's a monster's card because any monsters play sense. Because, I mean, Draconids, they're kind of monsters. Yeah, so right. it, it makes sense to kind of include it in the monsters faction. It's just so synonymous. Here we go, though. The Usurper is coming out. What leader is it? It's Radovid. Oh, it's Radovid. It is Radovid locking that Necker. He didn't get a double Necker lock, though. He could have potentially denied a consume from Forkdale, right? Although, I guess, actually, with Phoenix, it's precisely the same. So, Bruce Ritual will be coming out and resurrecting. He has to be very careful with how he stacks these rows to make sure he can play around Igni, at least with a Forktail. Yeah, very much so. He needs to be very careful. I mean, that Forktail... In, in the middle row, I think it'll be okay. Actually, it's questionable. Yeah, can he avoid Igni? That's a good question. If he can, then he, the game, I think, is... Certainly over. I mean, just the card advantage plus that Igni getting a, a fork tail would be huge, and you can get three more Neckers out, not more than that. You don't have a Ran ticking, you know, over the next few turns as well, while, while Sloth's still playing his hand out, so... Oh, and Sloth knows what he's doing. He puts the, the Joaquin there to try and, you know, boost that roll yeah, a little bit. he's padding up the row stats to make sure that that Igni will be hittable. Very well played by Sloth there. Perfect positioning. That Necker's going to come down. What he wants is he wants... Well, get what Game King wants is a Necker to get hit by Igni, not anything else. He does not want that Forktail to die. And I think Forktail on the Siege row would be okay at the moment. Into two Neckers? Would it, uh, yeah, it, it'll... Well, yeah, because it's eating four strengths. So it would only go to 16. That's and it would be 23 with the Phoenix on the row. So it'll be okay on the Siege row right now. Um, there are no more Disloyal units to come from Isloth. So Game King can avoid the Igni, which is a big, big brick. That turns that into just a five-point lump, which is unfortunate. But Vulgar Forts, and, you know, he's still got tempo. No he's still got a lot of tempo. And, of course, Meno was used in round two, so that isn't an option with the Infiltrator play. It's not really a threat here, um, which is why the Infiltrator was played so early. It didn't wait for that, for this Forktail to come oh, out. Oh, no. Will the Necker that comes out be bigger than the Forktail? That's the question as well. Ooh, yes. Because that blocks be. the Igni. Anyway, if, it's, yeah, yeah. If, if they stay at the same strength, that would be devastating, but... A lot, of, a lot of calculations going on here by Game King. We'll have to see now what strength the Necker comes out at. There we go. Seven, double seven. 18. Oh, 18. there we go. Yeah. So he has blocked boosted, the yeah. Igni perfect. masterfully. There we go. That is a sigh of relief for Game King, I'm sure, because when he sees that go down, he's going to gonna feel good about that one. Vilgafortz doesn't even have a particularly great target. He's going to be burning five strength. You know, typically you want those Vicavaros or whatnot to get burnt, or the Keliak by uh, Vilgafortz. But he's going to have to burn a five strength, which is unfortunate for him. We saw Game King, I mean, so far behind in card advantage, but we see the finishing plays here with Forktail, how big of a tempo swing that really was. And Igni, of course, not finding the greatest targets either. Task. We could see a monstrous pull here, but we'll see what it is. Vicavaro, I think? Yeah, it's a Vicavaro. So, Emissary's coming out. Good old spy engine. Double Vicavaro, double Emissary. My prescription Triple Emissary, <laughs> let's go! That is and a big another finisher. Imperial Brigade, that is a lot of points, but it's just not going to be enough. As long as there is another Necker left in the deck. As long as there is another Necker left in the deck, and we and have already be. been wrong about that. There should that. be, because uh, with the Necker locked, we saw a lot of... I mean, there, I think there's definitely a Necker yes, left, there is. and he edges four ahead by points. four points. This is two Nilfgaard consume matches that have gone to three points and four points difference. Incredibly close games here so far. Yeah, I mean, we always... 
we can't really predict it because it's hard to predict when you don't know exactly. I mean, because it's a deck that is so explosive in its finishers yeah. that you don't really, it's hard to calculate exactly how many points you're going to get. Like, you can say, you know, Keem, okay, he's, you know, normally 20, 25 points, you can kind of, that's yeah, the ballpark sure. it's in, so you can kind of predict that. But with Neckers, it's, it depends on how many, how much the Vran's consumed in, yeah. in earlier rounds. It's really hard to call. Yeah, we uh, can't see deck order or anything, so we don't know what strength Necker will be coming out. So it is legitimately excuses, but it is very difficult for us to predict. But that's such a close game. But we see Consume emerging victorious, just edging over Nilfgaard in both cases. And Consume showing why this deck is so powerful and why you kind of have to bring it to the tournament. I mean, Coleman, he had to bring it, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> JJ predicted that it was a deck that everyone would bring, or, or most people would bring to this tournament, and he targeted for it. And, and if you target well, you draw well, you're gonna, like we saw, it pretty much insta win um, yeah. against Consume. So it's a tough call if you're gonna bring it or not, but we've seen here why it is being brought, uh, why it's so powerful, even though it has a very debilitating weakness in that, you know, for example, artifact compression, uh, Swears, you know, cards that just shut them down completely. Yeah, it's a really interesting point as well for tomorrow, actually, because whoever wins this series will be going on to face JJ and his monster-hating madness, and they're going to have to play monsters, and they're going to have to win with it, so it may be a, uh, you know, sort of shadowy fate awaiting the winner of this match, but this series continues. Going into our third game, the score is 1-1 between Belarus's Isloth and Austria's Game King. And we see two very different decks here. We see, obviously, a mirror back uh, for... Uh, Game King, and uh, we see Sloth finally changing to a new faction. Uh, this is Skellige, King Bran, and we see Olgird in hand. We're gonna have to see if Sloth is list and see exactly what discard targets he is running, because that might be a, some bad news for him. Yeah, that could be a big brick depending on what his discard targets are. If we take a look at his list We now. are looking at a, at a Nova, uh, King Bran list that is running Olgird as its... Olgird and of course the Raiders as, as his discard target. That's target, his triple so. discard target though. Not ideal start for, for Sloth here. I mean, you want to see Olgird in your deck so you can discard it with King Bran and get it, you know, straight to the graveyard without really losing out on tempo. I mean, he can discard a ship and res it. So yeah, he I does mean, have other options. But yeah, that Olgird having to be played from hand is very uncomfortable indeed and not something that he's going to be too happy with. Exactly. It means it's just, you know, a slower start. And of course, Sloth could not use King Bran here and save it for next turn if he wants to. Although it's probably better just to use, <laughs> just to play Olgir from hand here. Possibly. Open pass from Game King. What do you make of this second open pass? I think it's a good strategy. I mean, spies uh, guaranteeing this card advantage into the next turn and, and making sure you have a long round two or three. Um, because if Sloth doesn't dry pass, he knows his spy is going to get answered by Cantarella. So you're, you're pretty much guaranteeing either Sloth risks it and, try and tries and get card advantage in a short round two where he has to play, he can't dry pass. Or he, he goes into a long round of three against Spy, which is devastating. I mean, the boat engine is great and all, but enforcers or machine guns, they, they, they end yes. up being 20 point bronzes, so it's really tough to get much better than that. There's a couple of answers to enforcers sitting around there. We've got Whale Harpooners, you can easily you know, throw around and kill one of them. And then we have an artifact compression too, although that does deny it getting used on something like whatever Joaquin pulls, but it can actually be worth more value in the long run by shutting down those enforcers. So I think this is going to be an interesting one. I think that both decks do very well in long rounds. I agree with the drive pass completely from Game King, especially mm. being on blue coin and not being able to answer the carryover, for yes. example. Um, having to save the spy for the next turn and, and, you know, plays like that. I think it's definitely a correct play from Game King to... I mean, you lose out on the chance to answer to, for example, Siri Nova, but in general, I think uh, looking at the whole game plan and, and how these decks perform, uh, the dry pass it, there is not, you know, it's not a bad play at all. No, I don't think it's a bad play at all. I think it's a very uh, interesting setup for the rest of the match, though, with, you know, potentially what we saw last time where a very long round leads into a shorter round. The thing is, both of these decks, you know, that's that's what they like to do. So it's going to be an interesting one for sure. I think that if Nilfgaard's engine is answered, Sloth is in a good position. I have to look at the gold cards in each player's hand as well, because the bronze engine in general, I think Spies is a little bit better. Um, yes. It can also kill ships, for example, as well with the Enforcer and the Ping. So uh, you have a way to kind of, you know, there is no control from Skelga, uh, to be honest. Uh, only Igni and Coral, for example, but no real control in terms of uh, direct removal on engine pieces. So... I think Game King's plan is going to go unanswered, and when it, start, it starts ramping up uh, with the Emissaries, it's going to be pretty unstoppable, to be honest, in, in a long round. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting one to see. We see Game King, Vicavaro, Mediking. Is he going to steal the ship? Is he going to steal the Pirate it's, Captain? It's he an could... option. I mean, why yeah. not? You're gonna, it also helps keep the uh, Brigade a lot lower, as long as those two units don't go to the same strength uh, where Igni becomes, you know, a very, good, a very good answer because it'll kill two engine units. They're going to get, you know, pretty big, so... In general, Vic of Automatic, great to, you know, 
play emissaries multiple times, mm -hmm. but also great to kind of disrupt your opponent's strategy. Yeah, the great thing is Game King knows with the size of these hands, by taking that ship, he knows that he has probably bricked one, if not two, of Isloth's cards in hand. It's a really, really, you know, sort of a potential value. Like, the EV of it is really, really high. So, yeah, it's a great play by Game King. I like that pick of our medic. Yeah, it slows down the, the, the spy engine in general, but I think uh, if you're looking at a very long round and trying to disrupt as much of uh, Sloth's game plan as, as possible, I think it's definitely the correct call. Yeah, and already we see spies starting to fill the board for Sloth here. This is going to be third spy tagged, and immediately that makes playing those engine units going to be pretty scary if one were to come out from uh, Joaquim or whatnot. We do see Menno in hand for Game King. He has the option to shut out that ship whenever he wants to, of course. Uh, the more turns he waits, obviously it's pinging his own units, it's damaging units, so uh, that's a point that he's taking every turn he waits, uh, basically. Because um, the, the ship grows you know, by two points every turn, but he's going to shut it down no matter what. So with the Menno and that spy tag on it already, so he doesn't really have any rush to kill it immediately. He can wait and get uh, just squeeze out those extra points from Sloth. Yeah, exactly. Olgird has the curse tag too, so it's going to make those Marauders weaker when they come down if Olgird's dead. So like you say, he can just wait. He's got all the time in the world for killing that ship. And we are going to see him move into some more of his tempo. He's lacking, like, you know, really solid ways of getting through his deck in his hand. That's one of the weaknesses of Game King's hand right now. But he does have Vilgefortz for the Vicavaros, which is a nice play. But Joaquim coming out of him is huge. 11 strength priest doesn't fray into a Beastmaster, into an 11 strength bear. Oh my goodness. That was a fantastic play from Sloth. I mean, that's, I've, a few times have I seen him into, into you know, into Joaquim that can just pull such a great tempo swing wow. there. And of course, Game King, uh, this is a deck that ramps up very quickly once you start getting the emissaries and just all your engine units on board. If Sloth can, can create a big tempo gap and find a point where uh, he spent, he makes Game King spend his engine units, but not surpass in, in terms of card advantage, and, and he can get a good pass, maybe with uh, five to six cards left. That's going to be the ideal uh, time for Sloth to pass and get a shorter round three where there are no engine units for Game King. Yeah, absolutely. You're 100% right on that one. But that was a crazy Heim coming out of Ice Sloth. Hitting that Joaquim is such an amazing target for that. And, so, force, and forcing out the high tempo Vilgefortz from yeah. Game King that can't save that, for example, for round three. Yeah, you'd love Vilgefortz in round three, but Game King had to close that gap. That was almost a 40 point gap that that opened up and Game King had to make ground back otherwise Sloth could have passed like you say for either significant card advantage or you know a way shorter round so it's an interesting play there I wonder if we see I mean this is an interesting one I believe that he would have the bear on the summoning circle so he can't even summoning circle the Joaquim that's that's a great high he's going to be very happy with that I mean, obviously you can always catch up in terms of tempo with Menno, for example, and, and obviously you have that, that way to catch up quickly. Even if you see a 40 point gap, we see, you know, Joaquin, Menno, we see cards that can do it. I mm -hmm. mean, these are cards that you want to save for round three, but if, if you have to use this turn, you can use them and, and you'll be fine. Um, but in general, I mean, Sloth, I think, is going to do just that. Just try and Patience squeeze as much as possible out of Game King in terms of his bronze uh, kind of uh, engine units and, and kind of the synergy between the spies and the emissaries. Um, and once he gets, you know, maybe three or four, or maybe five engine units out of, uh, you know, into this round um, and still doesn't get surpassed, that's when he's going to find the pass and, and try and go into a shorter round three that's not as devastating as, a, you know, a very long round three against Spice. Yeah, and speaking of important engine units, here comes an Imperial Enforcer onto the board, of course. Recently changed to shoot retroactively. It is going to unload all over Sloth's board. All geared, falling to it. Losing one damage value there, but, you know, that's one strength off of the Marauder later and put something else off the board so it's a uh, yeah he's 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 starting to do it. he's starting to get engine units out and that's exactly what he still wants as you say and sloth is getting closer and closer i mean uh, gang is getting closer and closer to the you know to equaling sloth the score but of course skill onto marauder is a good way to kind of say you know give me some space uh you're playing you know a bit too high tempo let me play my really high tempo <laughs> plays and get that that gap back in my favor yeah, definitely. And Game King, you know, he doesn't even have the double enforcer down to immediately kill the Iris. That would require an additional play. So outside of really expensive round three cards like Menno, he's not necessarily got the best ways of closing the gap here. Although he does have another emissary available on that Vicavara medic, as and you can see there. We see that Menno can kill that ship, but we also see Igni can kill, you know, Game King's ship that was stolen from Sloth's graveyard. So both players have a pretty similar uh, gold play to make there to try and, you know, trade uh, the tempo there. So not if, if Game King ends up using the Menno, uh, Sloth can answer with Igni and make sure that Igni is indebted in a short round three, for example. Really nice Asai here from Game King. I'm loving his Asai gameplay today. Shuffling a four-strength Olgird back into Sloth's deck 
and the Dimmon as well. So those are two draws that Sloth would not want round three, and it really makes his mulligan risky business. Yeah, very different meta. Uh, a Sire being much more aggressive nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Not so Sire much, being so disruptive, it's fantastic. Not so much defensive and kind of, you know, setting up your own plays, but more disrupting your opponent's plays, which, you know, I think adds a, a higher skill ceiling as well. You have to know your matchups well and know what cards would uh, affect your opponent the most if they're back in their deck. So Game King has definitely studied this, and a Sire being quite useful for him, not so much in terms of tempo, but more in terms of utility and kind of uh, setting up plays for, for future rounds. Yeah, I really love seeing that, like, the card hasn't changed, yet its role in the meta has shifted, and it has become such a disruptive anti-game plan force. It's really, really fantastic. We see the Igni coming out from Sloth. Sloth is committing significant tempo to this round. He's putting the pressure on Game King. And this might be a meta trade, uh, because they're kind of similar plays, or it might just be an Irish trade. Um, which obviously gets pinged by the ship and then ah, yeah, uh, the ship ping killed by the enforcer. Course, yeah. Or not. Or not. Ganking <laughs> likes, Ganking likes thinking his plays through. He definitely doesn't want to make any mistakes here. A lot on the line. And he needs to make sure he can perform here and try and get, you know, the best plays possible at all moments. Sloth's got some big tempo sitting in his hand. Though. That Marauder is going to come out pretty big. There's a Coral, of course, which can shut down a buffed up Brigade. He's got a lot of tempo. He especially, can keep the pressure up if he wants to. Especially if Coral ends up hitting, uh, you know, if if the Iris buffs the Brigade, for example, it's just four extra points yeah. for Coral as well, or five extra points for Coral as well. So uh, maybe Game King trying to get a little bit lucky here, trying to, you know, hope and pray to the Iris gods that uh, it buffs the right targets. Speaking of extra points for Coral, that is Coral not actually, you know, putting anything other than five points on the board, but the denied explosion from Iris is huge. That is effectively 25 value on that Coral, making it a 30-point play. Really, really fantastic from Isloth there. And it's very interesting here, Summoning Circle would hit the artifact and not the Iris It here. would, yes. Very important thing that I think Game King definitely knows, it's something that you can't really uh, play around with as a pro player. If you end up, you know, using that Summoning Circle and get an artifact instead of Iris, it's game losing. So, Game King knows this, obviously, there is not a tooltip anymore with Summoning Circle, there's a higher skill ceiling, you have to really know all the possible situations. I think Genkin knows this and decides to go for the Vikovaro Medic instead. Yeah, he's just needing to charge up these engine units, get more spies on the board, because he's actually looking for this late into a round as Nilfgaard, only having, well, this is his fourth spy on the board, is a really low spy count, and it's hurting those engines. And the Enforcer can kill cursed units here and definitely kill all these weakened units. I'm surprised he hit the Bran and not... Um, although he still has more takes with the second Enforcer, but um, he doesn't want to get rid of these weakened units that uh, the Marauder would benefit from yes. um, at the end of this round, too. Oh, that's the pass from Isloth. Isloth saying, okay, you know what? Maybe I've pressured you enough, but Menno is actually enough. Menno is 33 points right now. That would put Game King to, well, officially not points-wise, but it would basically be 107. So it would be four points clear. So... Yeah, Menno is enough, but that's such an expensive card, especially with double Infiltrator in hand for assigning those targets round three. Yeah, it's an interesting, I mean, the fact that you use Marauder there with such a long round where it gets, you know, such a high... Uh, obviously, you're playing Marauder for about 20 points in this. I mean, obviously, with the Enforcer killing of some of those units, uh, it lost some value, but it's still pretty valuable in this long round, and I don't think Gang could have caught up without using the Menno anyway in two plays uh, time, so... Ooh, we see the Ogre there, not what you want to see in the round 3 yeah, top deck. Yeah, that's forcing the mulligan right there, and it goes into a Whale Harpooner, so he does manage to convert it, he manages to avoid absolute disaster, but it's not a particularly powerful hand. Harpooner is just not going to find great value in a round this short. Yeah, and we still see 9 cards left in his deck, there isn't a chance to, you know, have 4 cards left and hope you get, for example, a Siri Nova right off the bat, so... This is, this is oh, tough for Sloth. And if this is replied to with an Ulderic, there's the Summoning Circle potential there for a second spy for Game King. Game King's hand is looking superior, especially even just with a finisher like Joaquim, my Sloth is lacking. Yeah, but, um, I mean, yeah, we're missing a lot of the key pieces that we want to see in, in finishers in terms of, you know, Siri Nova, for example, with this Caligo deck. It, it, it has a deck building cost where you can only run uh, two cards of each bronze unit to run that mm. Siri Nova, but if you can't play Siri Nova in the end, then it, you just have a, a kind of a worse deck for no reason at all, so... If Sloth can find Siri Nova, he's already missing on a lot of points in terms of finishers. Yeah, and I mean, we refer to Siri Nova Dogs decks as Siri Nova decks for a game. reason. They win, unsurprisingly, by playing Siri Nova. And if you can't get through your deck efficiently, and that Sire definitely did damage it, that Ulderic has got to, it's got to, dare I say, it's got to be a lucky Ulderic. And also running cards like, like Harpooner, for example, they can get more value in a longer round, but... Maybe Recon could have been a better choice to thin his deck better, yeah. or even Berserkers where you can pull them out with Skjall as well. For example, you could sick Drifa into Skjall again and get a Berserker if you're running Berserkers as well. But in this case, we only see Harpooners instead of Berserkers, uh, Raging Berserkers from Sloth. So 
not thinking as much, and maybe that hurts him in the, in the long run where he can draw the cards he needs to win the game. I mean, there's a potential that this is like a minor target that's happening, right? He can put uh, run whale hop in just to disrupt Varan's eating, but it's gonna really hurt in other matchups when you don't get that Siri out because of lack of deck efficiency, like you say. So while it's a nice minor target, it's a very minor target. And actually, I would argue that the cost to the deck is pretty significant. I believe we also haven't seen a Restore from Sloth as well, so two no, we key cards that he's not drawn in this match, and that might be kind of what dictates the outcome, because if you're not drawing into your... I mean, Restore is obviously a card that with Skellige, it works really well. You can some you can res uh, that that Restored Beastmaster, for example, multiple times as well, or even the 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 Pirate Captain mm. uh, with Sigdrifo in your deck as well. So you have both those options, and, and it's not only used just once, it can be used up to three times in a game. So if you don't draw Restore, you're losing so many points in the total you know, outcome of the, of the game. Yeah, and honestly, just with the look on Sloth's face, he's need? looking rather resigned. I think that he knows that the draws just haven't gone his way. He's gonna, yeah, he's looking at his graveyard, figuring out what he can potentially pull with Ulderic, but he's just, he needs that Nova to stay in this. We do still see a huge gap here. Uh, the Infiltrators yeah. aren't the greatest cards. Summoning Circle could potentially whiff and not find the greatest value. Uh, Joachim is going to be a great finisher, but we do still see a big gap. Obviously, Sloth has to play that Ulrich at some point mm. in time, and uh, there might be a, a Summoning Circle um, from Game King to kind of counter that, but still, there's a big gap here. We're riding off Sloth, but he still has uh, a fairly high chance to maybe win this game. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if the Ulrich does pull well, he can absolutely stay in this, and there is, like you say, a large point gap. But Joaquim is definitely going to go towards closing that, especially with a Kelak pull. That's an excellent pull from Joaquim. Going to be spawning an Emissary, I'd imagine. There we go. And this is just going to give access to those engine units. There we go. That Imperial Force are coming down, dealing six points of damage, killing those injured units, making that Berserker Marauder weaker when it comes out, and it killing the Emissary for... Maybe this is an anticipation of Spy Summoning Circle in case he gets a Vico. I like the Emissary kill. Yeah, and you have that last uh, bronze unit left in your deck, so it's definitely not going to be a dead card either. Um, I think that was, a, I mean, obviously killing those weakened units makes the Marauder also mm -hmm. weaker, so it's also a you know, great strategy call from Game King to know that his opponent is going to have a Marauder left in his deck and potentially going to play in this you know, very short round three, um, and he'll know to kind of counter that and get a few extra points as well. So if we see Game King winning by a few points, that's the reason why. Yeah, absolutely. It would be the third match in this series closed out by a few points if that was the case. But right now, we have Double Infiltrator and Summoning Circle going up against the Marauder and Ulderic. I dare say the Spies are going to be absolutely crucial at this point in the game. If yeah, depending on what Ulderic pulls, uh, it, it might be like, if you pull Seri Nova, that's a lot of points. You don't have Menno, you don't have any kind of counter to that, any immediate counter. So it means that it's a 25 point card. I mean, 25 points is a lot of points if yeah, you can't answer is. to them. Yeah, Siri Nova would be an absolutely fantastic draw. It would also make the Summoning Circle and the Spy probably not viable because it would increase the it would re restore the gap that had been closed by the Spy coming down. So Sloth has some interesting decisions to make on timing here. And if I to remember, nine we... cards in the deck, it's 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 gonna be it's gonna be dicey. I'll put it that way. Uh, Sloth likes taking his chances. He likes playing Usurper. He likes maybe drawing yeah, Siri Nova <laughs> when he has nine cards left. He's a guy that you know. He likes taking his chances and maybe playing high risk, high reward. He might get rewarded in this case. Also, good to remember, Game King is not running Igni in this deck, so he can't really answer uh, to Sierra Nova with the Summoning Circle on the Spy, or even a double Spy um, on the same row with Ulrich uh, being Summoning Circled by Game King. So there isn't that chance. He does not have Igni in the back of his deck waiting to get, you know, the play of the year. That's not going to get an option. Because, <laughs> I mean, there was actually an interesting timing decision here from Sloth, because if that Ulrich does get Summoning Circled back, it actually is an ex technically an extra point on his Berserker Marauder, because Ulrich is cursed. So it... If it goes down to being that close, you know, that could have mattered. Every point matters. No We've seen games already end by three and four points. So, you know, it sounds silly to point out, but it's it's a concern. So it looks like it is Ulderic time for Sloth. There's currently one point in it. And we see a very, very, very close. Right now, I mean, very, it's this basically is, tied is, right now. This is insane. Yeah. Whoever gets the better pulls, and I think... Ooh, Restore, Restore is a huge pull, but the summoning circle to counter the spy. So we've got to have to see what Game King gets. And of course, the summoning circle is going to be more efficient because you have the unfortunate, you have the impair brigade to yep. gain more value from it yep. as well. But the pull might not be as good. Oh, but if there's an engine pull, it's a big, big unit, and I don't know if the restore could catch up to it. We have Game to see what. Be, we have what? to see what targets restore has ahead in the after playing this? That's the main thing. But here is a. I mean, is it? You only have one play left, so you can't use a mirror. It's the last oh play you goodness. have, so a mirror isn't an option. You'd have to get impair brigade. 
Yeah, you have taken Pyro Brigade, right? And there's six spies down, so that's an 18-point unit. He's going to go two points ahead from this Ulderic because of the Enforcer and Ulderic themselves. Although he may actually choose to ping the, uh, the Harpoon, although it's actually similar value. So, yes, that's a very good choice because he doesn't damage a unit, so that doesn't add a point to a potential Berserker Marauder. And it's going to be Restore versus an 18-point Imperial Brigade. Restore has to do 21 points for Isloth to take this game. With Harpoon, with the, with the Longship still getting value as well. Yeah, with a longship still pinging, you're absolutely right. And what was that? I didn't quite see. Was it's that a pirate captain pirate into captain, a imagine? course here, potentially oh, into a ship. Gonna... Although a ship was... Yeah, he still has a ship left. Uh, I think this is enough to win it. It's enough. It? It's enough. Game King has 18 points tonight. He's on 81. It's enough. Slots on it. Oh, a harpooner. A harpooner. Because it is a machine, great. so the Corsairs can rest with harpooners, and it's definitely enough here. And another game goes down to <laughs> seven points. That was we crazy. I mean, seeing Kahir as the last card in your deck where you can't use it because it's the last card. If you use, obviously, Amir, you need two cards left to use it. It can't be yeah, your last card that's played. That's so horrible timing. And Sloth won that by holding off on the Ulderic because the Summoning Circle Ulderic offered Kahir. It was the patience of Sloth in not burning a spy. Exactly, so many yeah. players play their spy early in round three for the options, but Sloth's patience won him that game. We have had three games so far in this series, and there's been a grand total of 14 points difference between the players. Kahir would have been, it would have been a guaranteed win. Yeah, it was, it was a win. With Kahir being done. able to, yeah. you know, replay emissaries, replay whatever card you steal with, with the medic, for example. Obviously, Kaleg was boosted, so it wasn't the best unit to pull back, but it was much more value than just an, an Imperial yeah, yeah, by yeah. itself, obviously, because uh, you add the seven points from Mir, and it's already, or eight points with Kahir as well. But the fact that the spy was used at the very end didn't give, you know, there wasn't a chance to play Amir because you can't play it with only one card left, yeah. so... That was Sloth's huge. patience, actually, I don't, I don't know why I'm surprised that a guy called Sloth is taking it slow, but that actually just won him the game. Wonderful play by both players here, but an excellent managed round by Sloth. Although we have to say he did pull a restore, which is, you know, either restore or Novo gave him the best yeah, chances okay. of winning, so yeah. he had that going for him, but in general that was just a crazy game. Uh, great plays from both players, and in the end coming down to very small decisions that ended yeah, up, you know, favoring absolutely. Sloth in the very end. Absolute masterful play shown by both players so far, though. What a series. And we're going into the fourth game. It looks like we are going to have the Usurper making an appearance again with Isloth piloting, and Game King is going to be playing his brand. Yeah, it's going to be, I mean, we saw Amir, now we see Usurper. They're going to be very similar decks. Some, you know, key differences that we we talked about earlier on uh, in the Consume matchup against Nilfgaard, but in general, very similar decks, very similar engines, very similar game plan as well from Spies. Um, it's been this way for a few months now. Obviously, Enforcers are a bit different. They're a bit more of a machine gun uh, play right now <laughs> with that finisher, like you said earlier on. But in general, it's going to be kind of the mirror we just saw, but again, reverse. It's really interesting. We saw Nilfgaard into Consume, Consume into Nilfgaard, and now again, Skellige into, into Nilfgaard and Nilfgaard into Skellige. So, yeah, they're, they're, really they're swapping decks. It's fair, right? You know, somebody wins on one deck, then it's the other person's go. So we are going to see Game King on Skellige this time. But, you know, even though he's not playing his beloved Nilfgaard, he's very, very used to playing against this faction. He is, like you say, Nilfgaard has been around for quite a while now, actually. It's been a mainstay of the competitive scene, really, for, honestly, five months? You know, quite a while. So Game King, he knows the way. He knows how to play against Nilfgaard. And he'll be very comfortable playing this matchup. And we see Restore already in Game King's hands. We have to, he doesn't have to worry about drawing that card or not, uh, having to top deck it with Ulrich in round three. Um, in general, he knows uh, that he's going to have that, you know, great amount of points with the Restore. Not just a, a common silver that you just get for, you know, 20 points, whatever. It adds a lot more than that in terms of carryover as well for round three. So very happy to see that in his hand. Doesn't see Siri Nova yet, but he has a lot of chances to still fin and pull it out with Ulrich as well. He certainly does. And unlike Sloth, he does actually manage to discard his old gear, which is definitely somewhat preferable so game king looking to just get his engines on the go i'd imagine okay. we do see a bit of a different deck uh really similar from from game king uh, compared to sloth is king bran yeah. but instead of harpooners he is running the the raging berserkers which gives him the option to use skill uh multiple times and, and not have you know always yeah. have that uh guaranteed target ready to go shame, I yeah straight up I, I i prefer them i prefer raging berserker in the deck i think i think it's a smart choice and from Isloth, we've already seen his Usurper deck, of course, but there are the traditional Nilfgaard engine units in and some fun twists as well with cards like Usurper. So, yeah, if you're just joining us, this is currently 2-1 in Isloth's favor. These players are playing for a spot in the semi-final tomorrow. Super JJ will be their opponent. That has already been decided with Super JJ winning over Colomoan. But this is to go on to the semi-finals. There's a lot at stake here, and Game King is now playing for survival and Sloth is playing to move on. 
And seeing this kind of a mirror matchup between these two uh, opponents, I think it's gonna be pretty clear that we're gonna see a very similar game plan where... What a roll! Oh my goodness! What a usurper rolling that Radovid Game King looking absolutely devastated. Sloth showing no, no emotion This was planned. This was completely planned. Stone-faced killer. Look at that. He knows what he's doing. He knows, you know, he's always going to draw the leader he wants because he is a skilled player and he guarantees that Radovid draw. <laughs> and he gets a double lock. I mean, he has exactly practiced what he wanted. playing Radovid from Usurper so much that he can do it at will. That it, is how good it's Sloth It's a hard is. art to master, but Sloth Obviously, he's showing us that the second time already pulling Radovid, and in a great situation again. Um, first time locking an Ecker, which is you know pretty good value, and here uh, locking two ships, not just one, but two ships, which is absolutely massive for Game King's long round potential. Yeah, that is just such a huge blow to Game King's long round, like you say. Just <laughs> Sloth absolutely pulling out the heart of the cards, drawing his Nova two with the Zul oh sorry, Game King drawing the Nova two. So nice fortune for both players here, but that Radovid, I just think is absolutely enormous in this round. And we see the summoning circle plays here from both players. And of course we see Igni in both players' hands so they can both do the, you know, double spy Igni play that players love so much in ladder because he gives such a huge tempo boost uh, <laughs> with a great, uh, you know, double 13 Igni target. So both players are going to be doing pretty similar plays here, I think. Uh, it's, I mean, these plays are going to be pretty obvious um, going into this. Yeah, this is... <laughs> both players are going to be aware of what the others are running as well. These are very familiar decks. Outside the Usurper, both players know their way around these decks. But there we go. There is the double spies that everyone is so fond of. I'm sure there's absolutely no comments about spies right now. But uh, there we go. Four golds in the hand of Game King going up against three golds in the hand of Isloth. So both players, they're drawing their powerful cards. This is going to be a real fight. Although we don't see Cantrella in uh, Sloth's hand or any chance of pulling with Rainfar in either, yeah. so G Game King, uh, can, you know, funnily enough, he has won the Spy Battle, playing you know a deck that isn't Spies. But in this case, uh, you know, Spy used to be the the great deck that could always pull Cantrella with Rainfar and always had options to pull it out. But in this case, now we see Game King uh, with that in his favor. He can bleed out this round. He doesn't really care because he has card advantage, and Sloth doesn't have uh, the Cantrella to answer back. Yeah, and there is that Igni sitting there for the 26-point burn on those double Ulderix, which is very, very tempting. But actually, Game King can leave them there for a while, of course, because he could just use that Tempest Swing at any point. But there is certainly a gap to close right now. It can be blocked by, by an Impaired Brigade if it's it played can, in that yeah. back row, which is an option. But I think Game King knows if Cantrella wasn't played already, it won't be played. Uh, there is no option for Sloth to get that Cantrella, so... Uh, Unless he gets it from Volgaforge, for example, but uh, other than that, it means that he can kind of play this round very slowly, uh, set up plays for the next turn, uh, bleed out Sloth of his engine units and make sure he has a shorter round three where uh, Siri Nova and uh, the Restore target are much more effective than just Joaquim, for example. So I think he knows he can kind of take his time here. We see a huge point gap, but Game King, he's not worried. Yeah, Game King has absolutely no urgency in this round, right? He's very comfortable just playing what he's happy, almost discarding because every card that he plays right now is essentially a delaying action. There's such a big point gap that he's not necessarily going to choose to really apply pressure to Sloth like we saw Sloth do to Game King last game. Uh, instead, he's just going to play delaying actions, but actually, no, he's not. He is going to go for pressuring if he plays this Igni, he's considering it. If he plays this Igni, he is now swapping from delaying into serious pressure. Although this also might just be a read that Game King knows he's going to a short round three. Igni might not find a guaranteed target, doesn't want to risk it. Plays it out this turn, also makes it so that if Vilgoforce does bring out Rainfar to Cantarella, it's a lot harder for him to end up playing that spy uh, and still staying ahead because there isn't, you know, that 20 or 30 point gap uh, like there was before. So, in general, I think uh, Game King just taking that into account and, and trying to make sure he doesn't go down a card going into round three. Yeah, certainly. I think that Game King is going to be probably actually favoring a short round quite a lot more than Isloth because of cards like Siri Nova. I mean, actually, to be honest, if Game King could go one card v one card, he'd probably be very, very happy to do so. So we could see him pressure all the way down to there. I mean, a lot of his pressure was locked away with that Radovid, but double 18s, you know, that there's a lot of spies on the board already for Sloth. So Sloth can close gaps and he can catch up very quickly. And I mean, uh, we see as well, Infiltrator Menno is a two-point, a two-card combo. So mm. if if you have to force that out this round, you're already getting a lot of resources from your opponent that he would have wanted to save for round three. And we also don't see Rainfarn or Drakim in Sloth's hand right now. So potentially he doesn't draw it, and he has a worse round three, you know, even worse than we think. So uh, Game King doesn't know this, of course, but I think the shorter the better uh, for Game King with such an explosive, you know, restore and a Beastmaster and uh, you know, Siri Nova finish. Mm. So he's gonna want to, you know, take it slow. Uh, make sure he doesn't have any dead cards. Make sure he has the strongest and you know most effective cards for a short round three. Uh, 
and just bleed out Sloth of all his tools here, all his engine units, the enforcers, the brigades, and make sure he doesn't have any of that, you know, huge spy value that they get in the long round. Yeah, Game King's read that Sloth doesn't have Cantarella here is so important as well. Of course, it's obvious at this point, but he's known from several moves ago, which is really, really important because it means that he can comfortably know that he's going to go into round three on equal cards. And that means that because Sloth is going to win this round and has to play first, he is going to get to play Siri Nova unanswered, which is really, really key here. So... I think that for Game King, he's probably very comfortable right now. He's just going to keep, you know, maybe just drop the Raging Berserker, a couple more cards, and then, like you say, head into that explosive, like, restore Siri Nova. Exactly. And obviously, we see cards like Igni as well, not just Man on Infiltrator, but Igni, a card that needs, you know, a little bit of setup, a bit of a, you know, longer uh, round three to get value because it might be a dead card otherwise. And like you said, there is no, unless you draw Cantarella, there is no um, uh, possibility for Igni to be last save for Sloth. So unless the Spy is drawn for Sloth, uh, Siri Nova will go unanswered and Igni can't be, you know, a 30 point gold if played after Siri Nova. So uh, in the end here, Game King very happy with bleeding Sloth out and making sure he has the shortest round three possible. Yeah, and the more and more spies that come down, the bigger and bigger that Coral gets. He can use that Coral to immediately re-establish a gap and force Sloth to pay high value again. So Game King's in a really nice position for bleeding. Yeah, there's no option for the hero pass, especially not now. No, no, no. With, no, with no, so no. many cards left, but even when there's only two or three cards left. I think if you hero passed against a seven-card Skellige, you deserve a medal for bravery, but you also probably need help. So. And you probably, you know, don't end up getting past this round in the tournament, so yeah. that would be, you know, pretty worrying, I think, for Sloth. I think he prefers uh, getting to the semifinal over a medal from Merchant, uh, <laughs> Merchant State of you know Warfare Rewards. I don't know what that warfare what call rewards. That. That, that's what we're gonna Nailed call that it. for now. Boom. But we see a pass here <laughs> from Game King, and not the shortest round. I mean, we still see. Obviously, they both have some kind of engine. They both have yes. the possibility of, of resing ships. They both have Marauders, for example, with a skill. Um, but we do still see some some really good plays from Sloth in a longer round. Igni, Mano, and Infiltrator are gonna get a lot of value. Yeah, that is gonna get a lot of value indeed. So. Skial is still available. We have Raging Berserker. Rez is in abundance for Game King too. So both players sitting looking at very, very powerful hands. This long round does mean that Igni is likely going to have an impact in this final round, which is very, very key. So yeah, this is a tough one to call. Both players are looking at very powerful setups. And I think the most important uh, play in this round will be the Vogelforts. If it can find a card like Rainfarn, a card like Joachim, or a card like Cantarella, um, it will be you know the most important thing going into this into this round because there are cards you're going to need to win the round. I mean, I there are cards that the Sloth is currently missing and he needs his finishers, or as you know, to guarantee last say against that Siri Nova. Yeah, I think like the unanswered Siri Nova could end up being absolutely key here. Drawing it is, of course. Pretty important when it comes to playing Siri Nova decks. Restore is going to be coming out first. He's going to be going on a pirate captain to a Corsair to a ship, potentially. And of course, Restore, if only used in one round and you don't really have the chance to uh, res it multiple times, Pirate Captain is the better option because you have that guaranteed Corsair and that guaranteed, you know, long-term play with the ship. Over many turns, it gets a lot more value, and it's normally worth it to, to restore the Pirate Captain instead of the Beastmaster. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I like it. Like, this is such a long round, there's what, like, going to be minimum seven more turns? So that means that that long ship is really going to stack up value, and it's going to beat up resing anything else as a target. So I like the, I like this from Game King. He's investing, recognizing the length of the round, and he's just going to be setting up his engines as likely as Sloth to begin and, with. And we see the ships were both put back into his deck with the Sire because he, he could not use the Corsair to res him, and he loses some points there, so it makes the Sire potentially a, you know, a 11 plus 6, a 17-point card because yeah. it... it doesn't give the option to play Corsairs in this round three. So again, it's a silver that has a lot of utility and a lot of different options, not just, you know, uh, pure points like other silver. Yeah, this nice high base strength means that unlike many other utility cards in Gwent's collection, it actually sees a lot of play because not, it, yeah, it's like, it's a, maybe a lower tempo play, but the fact that it has a pretty good compensatory body means that it is in fact playable. So it's really cool and uh, very promising actually to see cards like Asai seeing play so consistently in the meta, I think. Yeah, it's never a brick. There's other cards that add utility that might be bricked in many situations where they don't have that utility situation and they don't have that, like you said, the base body at a, at a very high strength. But a Sire at 11 points, you know, pretty favorable. Um, and it's a pretty good silver to run regardless of a situation. Yeah, so we see the Vicavar is coming out, starting up that emissary chain. And like we said, in a, sh in a longer round three, these enforcers, these brigades still get decent value. They're still going to ping uh, for, you know, not just six or eight value, but a little bit more, which is definitely favorable for Sloth in this round. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the enforcers just really just stack up and up on value. So Sloth, like you say, the Vilgefortz is going to be key, but the rest of his hand is looking reasonably good. Game King, I imagine, is going to be dancing around Igni very carefully, but I simply think that he can't fully oh, avoid it unless he does some very careful placements indeed. 
There's no chance. As long as you There's don't no, well, get the, like the, next turn it activates, right? As long as you don't get a double igni, I mean that's that's definitely what you don't want to see. So mm. and he has to watch out because enforcers can really influence that and, and make it so there's some very awkward situations. So as long as he doesn't give the double igni to sloth, I think uh, that's all he can really do. I mean, there's going to be an igni for sure, especially with marauders coming out from the skull, for example. Uh, you're going to have uh, at least you know a decent you know 13, 14, maybe 16, 70 point igni, depending how much uh, sloth wants to wait here, but. In general, I think uh, Igni's going to be a really good card to, for Slot to play in this round three. Well, yeah, and if it catches a ship, it actually denies even more value than it burns because it's denying future value too. So Igni is very important for Slot, like you say. But then again, we do have a big Coral sitting there. But the question is, is it going to find a decent target? I mean, Coral, unless like, you know, a Joaquin pull comes out, it's probably just going to be hitting like a 12, 14 strength brigade, which isn't, isn't brilliant. I mean, the brigade will go to 14 when Infiltrator goes down, but... The main value from Spice right now is coming from that double enforcer. Yeah, and it's not just Igni. I mean, we see Igni and Menno. So there is two yep. op two big units from Skellige are going to get destroyed, uh, <laughs> burned away completely oh, in this round three. And that's, you know, that's really good news for Sloth. Yeah, it certainly is. There is a big old hey, row of one strength units sitting there at the front. Bear goes in front of the ship. And there's prevent Vicar medics. There will be two nines episodes. lining up uh, unless uh, Game can block that bear from getting hit in the next turn as well. But again, an 18 point Igni isn't going to be that great considering you're going to have Marauders coming out at a pretty high strength as well. So it wouldn't matter too much if he gets a double nine. Yeah, we'll wait to see what no, Soft does no, here. Coming in with the Infiltrator, tagging up that long ship, making it look like it may well get menoed. Although right now it's actually the only eligible Igni target on the board. He may be expecting a much larger play or waiting to see if he can answer Siri Nova due to potential Cantarellas and whatnot. So it's going to be an interesting one. The Vilgefortz is so clutch here. We need to see, for Sloth's sake, a good pull from this Vilgefortz. I think there'll be an Igni coming down no matter what. Um, so he knows that. And of course, placing it there makes it the Marauder is a bit worse because it's going to get pinged down by the ship. But you're risking it kind of lining up in a few turns. So he doesn't risk it. He decides to just play it safe. Uh, and still, only Igni's in the range row right now. Yeah, Igni only active on the range row. That Marauder, not enough to activate the 25 threshold required to burn him up. But we see the power cards sitting in Game King's hand. We've got Heim, we've got Siri Nova, we've got Coral. All of those represent significant points. Even, you know, we were talking about Coral not necessarily finding a huge target. Even on that brigade right now, it's 17 points. That's nice. Bearing in mind, Game King is already 26 points up. Now he's three points up because of that Menno, but that is Menno. That's a big piece, and it's not enough to put Sloth ahead. And we see a snapshot of why both these decks are so popular and so good. They've thinned down to three or four cards, and they only have goals left in hand. They have, you know, all their finishers ready to go in this round three, and him coming down... Gonna get out a Marauder, I assume, and it's gonna be a great Marauder. You're gonna get an Igni target the for sure. The Marauder is the Igni target, yeah. And Igni will not be dead, of course, in this round three. You have just too many points uh, to spill out over three rows. And a 17-point uh, Igni target, you know, 22 points total. Not too shabby at all, but we still see Coral and Siri Nova to finish here. Yeah, I mean, an unanswered Siri Nova alone sort of just negates the Igni, right? It's like... That's 25 point card, you know, that's, that's serious business right there. So I do think it's going to come down to, I don't even know if a good Vilgefortz pull is enough, to be honest. It's going to burn a one point, so eight value off the Vilgefortz. He's got to get a fantastic pull. Joaquin would, of course, activate the engines, which is very nice, although the brigade may well be artifact compressed by then. So You do play Nova first here, because you're going to get maybe a better... Uh, yes, you do, yeah. You don't, maybe Although don't actually, you might burn, Vilgefortz might want to burn Siri Nova, but I think it, it will not be a good play because uh, there's still, I think, a fairly good amount of value to get from getting King's Graveyard if he burns that Siri Nova. Uh, or from his deck, uh, rather, but he does, wow, he does he burn does Siri it. Nova and he gets a Berserker, which nice. will be enough, obviously. Um, not, you know... It, I mean, no matter what he yeah, pulled, yeah, it was enough it because enough. of the long yeah. ship, right? Exactly. It was just, I think that was just a sort of a fashionable concede from Sloth there. I agree, because there was really no option for Sloth. I mean, even if you pulled Joachim with, with Coral still being in, in Game King's hand, I mean, we see why Siri Nova is so good. I mean, an explosive 25 points to finish the round. Is fantastic, yeah. and even burning that away with Vilgefortz, it's just, it's just not enough. All right, so the remaining decks, it is going to be a Nilfgaard mirror to decide who will become tomorrow's semi-finalist going on to face Super JJ. The score is 2-2 in this series, which has seen incredibly close games and fantastic play from both players. So it's going to be the Usurper versus Emir. Can Emir 
avenge his father. There you go, that's some good lore for you. We've seen Usurper get pretty good pulls for Sloth, so if this is a, like a, if this is a He's true... He's double renovated from it. <laughs> if it's a true mirror, I think Sloth might have the edge because he's a skilled Usurper player and he chose it for a reason. <laughs> uh, we're going to see if we see that again in this game, but up till now, Sloth has definitely, you know, he's given us a good show with Usurper. Yeah, I mean, Sloth really, it's going to be about his mental fortitude because he's got to make sure that he hasn't tilted, he still believes in the heart of the cards, and he can get that Radovid to lock those enforcers or those brigades from Game King. So, yeah, the, the Usurper is going to be so clutch here. I mean, can he pull off three great Usurpers in a row? Yeah, the big difference here, there's a, there are a few differences in the deck list. We see um, that the Game King does have the Iris. He is on blue coin, though, and decides to dry pass just to make sure he can get, you know, some form of card advantage going to the next round. Um, and going into round three, obviously, he won't have last say, but uh, maybe in this matchup, not as important. And a mighty one-point Vicavara Medic seals the round for ISO. So we've got to round two, the open pass from Game King, of course. And let's see how this unfolds game king running dare i say a very and it's cool to be able to say this about competitive coin tech but almost like very old school nilf card list you know you got, you got your iris even a sire is like you know that's been around for a very long time so yeah game king really believing in the classics like kahir as well kahir really falling out of favor for a lot of people these days but game king's still a believer and it looks like we're going to be kicking things off with Ice Sloth in the second round. And for example, Iris could be trouble if you're playing a classic. <laughs> <laughs> I think these oh players like goodness. I think these players like machine guns. They're fans of, of machine guns well, in general. Why gonna, not? He's got triple enforcer in his hand. We're going to see very big value enforcers in round three. We're going to see a lot of emissaries. In general, it's going to be you know a game with maybe twenty point uh, bronzes all around. So fun for the for, for the fantasy for sure, but. This is, this is a ballsy play from both players. Yeah, this is going to be one hell of a round three. This is going to be a machine gun fight to the extreme. Triple enforcer sitting in the hand of Isloth. Equal cards, Game King having to make first play. So Isloth has the final final plot say. He's also got a spy in hand. Do both players have a spy in hand? They don't, actually. Only Isloth holding Cantarella. So no rain farm for game king means that he doesn't actually necessarily have although we see summoning circle from from game okay king, we so see he, he has that also it's, it's basically a second spy way. it is basically a spy let's be real so yeah that is gonna definitely make a difference in this round we need to see some fortunate pulls but on gold card advantage you know game king's got three golds three silvers we see three silvers two golds in isoth but it is igni and meno both of which are huge sources of removal arguably much more so than the impact of something like kahir so Triple Enforcer could end up being very key here. And the biggest difference, I mean, Iris and, and Igni, the two cards that are the most, you know, different between both decks, and both cards yeah. get huge value in the long round, and we're seeing Sloth without the... It's not a classic Amir Mirror, so there isn't the option to steal that Iris back to your hand and play it yourself, because <laughs> I, unless you, of course, you play Usurper into Amir, which would be kind of, you know, the end of the world, <laughs> because Sloth would be, you know, basically getting the best leaders every single time. Yeah, if, if Sloth pulls I the perfect like Usurper leader, he just becomes the, the king of Gwen. It's over. Everyone go home. Sloth's won. <laughs> like... But it's an option, and, and that's a dangerous thing. You have to keep it in mind. You have to keep Iris uh, until you know your opponent can't really play around it. Okay. Let's see how the initial emissaries go. Yeah, now we see a brigade come out for Game King. I think this is definitely good for Game King. He wants to save those enforcers to try and ping mm -hmm. away his opponent's enforcers. Yes. So if he gets brigades at the start, it's better because you can keep that damage and that removal uh, for a bit later on with his Sloth emissaries. playing the usurper. What's he going to get? Third Radovid coming in. No, it's a create, I think, because it's got a hide cards option. So I think it's a create leader. Then let's, let's not spoil it. We're going to see. This is... No, it's ju it's Calvate. It's Calvate. It's Calvate. That's uh, not a bad leader. That's a great leader. Like, to, honestly, Sloth proving that Usurper's deck doesn't have any bad cards with these plays. That's a, that's a pretty nice pull. You get, you get to thin a bit, and you also you know, get a leader that's not dead. That's the important thing. He would have loved it later, though, because when his spies replied to his summoning circle, he could have just pulled summoning circle from that. So exactly. Potentially premature, but he was definitely yeah. maybe trying to roll for the Radovid. Like, you know, he's wanting to lock, which is... That would have been three Radovids and three Usurpers, which would have been pretty impressive. So, well, I say impressive. It would have been something. And we see one Imperial Brigade in each row, playing around the Igni, making sure there is no, you know, double Imperial Brigade in, in a single row. Um, maybe, you know, hinting at, at the chance of a double Igni. So, definitely knows that Sloth has Igni. They've both seen each other's decks uh, throughout this, you know, throughout this series. And they both know what dangers await in this very long round three and what to play around. Obviously, this is, a, this is a match that matters so much for both players. Obviously, best of five. This is the last match of the series. It and is. The match it's all come down to this. That dictates who gets to get, you know, 
uh, into a bit of a brawl with JJ tomorrow against that, you know, My Necker hating deck. Yeah, it's going to be Necker hating decks that, that, that JJ has brought. Yeah, so this is going to be a 12 card Nilfgaard round. That's not even counting the spies to decide the semi finalist for tomorrow, who, of course, has a chance to go into the final and therefore challenger in April, never to mention the thousands of dollars of prize money. But, you know, it is a very, very tense situation for both players. Both players are going to be mulling over their thoughts considerably because when you have this many cards and one round that matters so much, the sequencing is everything. So mercy. expect to see these players really go in depth on each play. Vilgefar is coming out quite early, burning that usurper away. One less spy, and he gets the removal here with the with the enforcer, but nothing really to remove. There really isn't the option here to to get uh, kill an enforcer, kill an important uh, an importance brigade. So in the end, just you know, decent value, but not much more than well, that. Well, the beautiful thing is as well, Kahir can now resurrect the usurper, and Game King can do a little bit of rolling of his own. So this might get very interesting. Sloth couldn't find the Radovid, but can Game King? That's very true. We're seeing maybe some regret from Ganking. Wanted to bring Usurper as well. Ended up bringing Amir. <laughs> now he says, you know, I'm just going to play, you know, a bit of Usurper as well. Try and see what I get. Um, try and roll that. Roll those odds. And of course, this is similar to Deekstra with Renew, for example, because it is a spy on your on your board. You can kind of play that to your favor. All right. So here comes the summoning circle for the spy. I'd imagine it would be pretty unusual for him to not decide to go with that i believe but he looks like he's game king likes thinking his place through he likes taking his, taking his time and he ends up not going for summoning circle instead he goes for kalak maybe trying to get a summoning circle on potentially i mean he can always summoning circle his own uh rain farm cantarella once yeah, his can. opponent yeah, answers it and he wants to maybe thin his deck before using his spies to try and guarantee uh cards like Joaquin, for example to finish yes. it off so uh, that might be the, the line of thought here from Game King. Also, maybe he's trying to get a, a cheeky summoning circle on Iris in some kind of way, uh, which would be, you know, a decent 25-point silver. Yeah, that would be fantastic to see, but uh, I don't know how Iris would be summoning circle. You'd have to, you know... Oh, Nilfgaard you... is very unit-focused faction. I mean, relying on no sp no unit being played is pretty risky when it comes down to it. You can get a gold to be played right after sure, Iris, sure, and, and it's fine. Gold, yeah, so yeah. There's always the option. Game King likes having his options open, trying to see what... He, he wants to get the max value throughout all his plays, and <laughs> he doesn't want to rush it. You know, he knows he can play probably something circle into his own Cantrell later on with Rainforge, so he's not really too worried about that right now. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting round to see how Game King proceeds. As soon as three spies are on the board, Sloth can start dropping enforcers to kill off the other enforcers, so... I imagine an assassin here potentially on the enforcer would be a decent play. Uh, yeah, I think instead so. Instead he decides to go for summoning circle on the enforcer instead and not uh, think about Cantrell at all. Very interesting. Uh, valuing, well, you know, to be fair, if the value of the Imperial Enforcer can match that of the value of the card advantage, then it's a fair enough play. And you know, the enforcers are super, super key here. However, there are three spies on the board, like I said, and that means that Sloth can just drop enforcers and kill Game Kings. It Retroactive might, shooting, let's it, go. It might also be that Game King knows that Sloth mm. runs both Summoning Circle and Igni. And he knows that if he plays Cantarella, he's not going to get that much value out of his opponent playing two Cantarellas and getting the Igni for 26 points. So he might just be playing around that play and making sure that uh, Game King, uh, Sloth can get a bit of a lower uh, value Igni and not, you know, that 26 plus 5 Igni is devastating. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about value and whatnot, but it is worth noting that Game King is currently 40 points ahead, well, 38 points ahead, so... That's a significant gap. I mean, there it is Nilfgaard. There are, of course, cards that can close that very, very easily, but this is already turning into a very high power round. And the Assassin, I mean, the more he waits for that, I think he wants to get rid of a unit that could get value over time immediately um, and also make sure he can get value out of his Enforcer, which was well already dead. I mean, he's already missing out on some of that value. So uh, it would be interesting to see if he doesn't use Assassin here on the Enforcer and decides to let it stick around. I don't know what his option might be to use that Assassin later on, what the mm. best target he's looking Highly for. Curious. I don't know. I mean, denying the value of the Enforcer seems really worth it, especially when you know, you, you know not all the slots are... Not all Sloth Spies have come out yet. He can't just kill it by taking an Enforcer from Sloth as Graveyard. It's also an option, so the Enforcer dies regardless and, and not much changes there. Taking the Enforcer is very important as well because it means that Iris will be immediately killed because he's got two shots now as soon as he plays the Spy, so it does enable the instant Iris. Here comes the Usurper Kahir. There we go. Actually, really great with Enforcers on the board. We see Henselt, Bran, and Uridin. Uh, not the greatest choice. This is what, you I just guess... go for a Warrior and deal damage? Does he have an... I mean... Hensel is Kedwani, I believe. So Kedwani only, yeah. Kedwani no machines, chance. yeah. So he goes for Erdin, spawns a warrior, kills a Vicavaro, and it buffs, right? It's yeah, it's not the worst option. I mean, it's something uh, <laughs> that would. You be, don't you don't want you navigator? Don't I'll want tell you that much for free. There we go. So he's going to kill a uh, two strength emissary. Actually, probably not emissary. Maybe just the Vicavaro. No, an emissary. Maybe it's an emissary. Okay. 
But I mean, so. honestly, that's, end, that's fine. Like that's minus one. What you know, it's it's not amazing, but it's. Oh, it's, it's really a value. I mean, you still get the spy tag as well with the usurper, yeah. so it's still worth it. Although we do see, spy. we do see that maybe Gangking hasn't practiced um, with usurper as much as yeah, Sloth, course. who has obviously well, he's an amateur usurper, right? Exactly. Sloth is a master of the art of uh, you know rolling that great leader. One with doesn't usurper. simply play, create, and get good cards. That is very true. There's there's a lot of practice behind that. Sloth definitely ready for this open, making sure he has the cards and the, you know the game plan he needs to win this match. But it's coming down to the very end, and we see a huge point gap between these players. Yeah, this is a really, really crazy point gap in Game King's favor. 47 points coming out. That is a lot. There are big Igni targets. You know, 21 point Igni's lined up. Both and uh, both brigades have the disloyal tag, meaning that whichever one isn't Igni can be killed by Menno. So that is two very swingy plays for Sloth, but that's just enough to like fill the gap. How's he taking the lead here? Yeah, no Menno, no Igni for Game King to have that, you know. Uh, swing as well. He has the Iris, which is going to be great, although he doesn't have any Enforcers on board. He is he just the... keeping the Assassin for Iris? I believe uh, that must be it. He, he's guaranteeing he can kill that Iris. Yeah, it's interesting. It's an expensive way to spend an Assassin, but if it's the only way that you can proc your Iris, you got to proc your Iris. And we can just see a Summoning Circle on the Iris anyway, so... And we do see an Enforcer still on the side of Sloth, and no real chance to kill it from ganking with a Sire or the Assassin if he saves it for Iris, so... This is tough. I mean, there's a big point gap, but Sloth has a much better hand and obviously card advantage as well. Yeah, the card advantage and cards like Joaquim, Menno, Igni. You know, well, Menno's 28, Igni's 25 right now. That's 53, right? Joaquim is what, average oh. 20? Summoning Circle, Circle comes out early. It's still obviously, no. Infiltrator is a great, oh, you know, Oh, he's playing here, around but... Menno. He's playing, yeah, and there's no Menno here. There's so no Menno here. This is no. what we talked about with the mind games. Yeah. He just lost points because he was trying to play around a card that his opponent might have. Game King doesn't have that card. So I it, mean, it's, it's a safe assumption. Game exactly. King's actually relatively it's, unfortunate to With not. five cards left, I mean, yeah. you're going to expect Menno in your opponent's you hand. You really are. That was, that was a great play to play around Menno. He just denied like 11 value off of the Menno, but Game King doesn't have it. There's no Kalak here to, to try and boost that Iris up either, so there's no option to play around that, I believe. Unless Kalak is drawn uh, with the Joachim, and that is Roach <gasps> instead, and oh, that is bad. Oh no, the Roach that is Sloth bad. just smiles to himself. That's a horrendous pull with the Joachim. Not what he wanted to see whatsoever. Especially the oh, fact that you can, that's... I mean, Igni and, and Menno was it, both... Was it worth, like, Menno-ing first just to it, get yeah, that out? Yeah, definitely. I think Igni and... Because there, there's no difference. You're going to kill those. There's no... Joachim has already been played. Yeah, it's, be it's all this future value. It doesn't matter how much you actually kill He's waiting for the four. Iris to maybe boost one or both of those units to try and get that yeah. extra value. And it doesn't, it doesn't end up happening. Doesn't. So it's a risky play from Sloth. We've talked about him trying Ooh. to get that high risk, high reward. If he puts a... Hang on. If he puts a spy on the board, he can ping the infiltrator and have a 36-point Igni on the range row. That is true. So he could actually get... Pretty high value on this Igni. He goes for Menno first, potentially doesn't matter too much anymore on the front or back row. There is no double Igni possibility on those rows, only on that that range row, so there's still some big swings to be had here. I, a obviously a Sire not doing anything, like we said before. Uh, she can add utility, but she can also just be a you know, kind of dead 11 point card. Uh, she can try and shuffle cards from cards like Emissary, so that there is no Spy Ping, for example, um, from the Vic of Automatic if he expects it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, that's sort of like 4,000 level 4 side. It's what you need to win these games. It's yeah. going to get close with Igni here being so, I mean, really, really high value and a Sire only being 11 points. It's going to be a lot closer than we initially thought with that Roach being pulled out, for example. That Roach was a horrendous thing to happen to Isloth. He, he's going to be regretting not playing that Menno first because it doesn't matter what strength you kill that Brigade at. You know you're going to be Menoing a Brigade. You don't need to let it get there, big. You're denying the value anyway, so. There are still Emissaries in uh, Game King's Graveyard, he didn't shuffle those back. There will be... And Enforcer works as well. It's probably better, if, depending on the units he had left. It's not going to be big enough, though, right? It's going to be 36 points on the 41. Igni plus the 5-point body. It's I think so it... close. It's yet another enormously close it's game, but it's really not close. enough. And we see five Game points. King edging out We have had games points. end by 3, 4, and 5 points this season. I think Sloth is really hitting Roach right now. Roach not in yeah. Ganking's deck, it oh isn't is Sloth's deck, and Sloth that might have lost in the game. That I was mean. an absolutely incredible series between those two players. It went the five games like we thought. Usurper, unfortunately, losing out for Sloth, but it was still fantastic to see Usurper's first tournament appearance. Wonderful show of uh, sportsmanship between these two fantastic players. Congratulations to both of them on playing a highly entertaining series. That was... That was magnificent. How'd you find that? That was great. I mean, we saw a lot of kind of mirrors between the factions and the different decks and the different ways to play the decks and what they each brought because there were differences with the decks. 
But in general, I mean, I went to game five, very close games, really good plays from both players. In the end, maybe Sloth uh, not playing that that gold card earlier could have maybe uh, affected the, the general outcome. I think outcome. it affected the outcome of the game. Because pulling Roach is the only one to pull um, more than Joaquin, but in general, Game King, being on blue, starting on blue coin, we gave the edge to Sloth because he had red coin. But Game King yeah. pulled through, really good plays, really good decks. I think he, he brought, he really thought about what he was, what he was bringing. We saw Sire being really good for him, um, being able to disrupt his opponent's uh, plans as well. And in general, I mean, great match from both players. They both proved they're great players, and we're gonna see really quickly. I think an interview between uh, Game King and Berger really quickly. Yeah, indeed. Let's head over. All right, I'm here with Game King. How do you feel, man? I mean, five points got you the game. So how do you feel right now? Yeah, I feel good about winning the series. It was like always close, always like five, seven, six points. But I'm a bit unhappy with my plays. I think I made some some misplays. Yeah. How do you feel going against Super JG tomorrow in the semis? <laughs> 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 yeah, good question. Yeah, Super JG, we already saw it in the first match. He has like the ultimate monster counter deck. At least I know his deck list, so I can maybe try to play around it somehow. But I think um, lineup uh, wise, he's like favorite, but I will of course give my best and try to win. Is there anything that you want to send over maybe to your brother or to your fans? Yeah, um, yeah, just play Gwent, enjoy it, and <laughs> my, to my brother, and maybe you will play as well <laughs> on Gwent. Hope. All right, cool, thank you. So, yeah, we'll see what happens tomorrow. Take it back to the guys then. <laughs> <laughs>